Welcome to the CES meeting. Today we have Ashley with uh, releasing Promise own properties. And then after that, we have uh, Guy Bedford with a module instance functions. Um, Ashley, you have the floor. Thanks. I'll share my screen. So this is a stage zero proposal and that I've taken over from Alex. So he kindly let me move this across to my um, my GitHub. So there's uh, it's currently GitHub, a cup more proposal a dictionary, and I will do the slides if they're more interesting. So the the problem is this. We go for a little journey of a code base. The code base starts very innocently. There's some sort of async thing that's happening. So it uses a wait to go grab it. Then time passes, a second thing comes along and we await that. And we've now created a little waterfall where these two things could have happened in parallel, but they, you know, it's just easier to write it this way. Someone comments on the PR and says, oh, you've got a waterfall. Let's make this more efficient. So it switches to promise.all. Everyone's happy. We're now doing the two things in parallel and just doing 108 for the two of them. All good. Everyone's happy. Then, you know, time goes by. Another thing comes along. The code's already using promise.all, so people just add another thing to the promise.all. And then another thing comes along. And then another thing comes along. And then sometimes, and I've seen this happen for real, is that that promise.all starts to get a little bit hard to read as people just keep adding things to it, similar to any kind of function that starts off with one parameter, then gets two, then ends up with six parameters. And by the time you get to there, you're kind of regretting that your language just has all and all parameters. And you're now worried about uh, things getting mixed up. And when you are reading this code as a human, I'm getting less and less confident that my destructuring here lines up with this. Or even if it does line up, I want to just like control click feature flags in my IDE and jump to where that's coming from, but I can't. So I have to manually kind of count. And I'm now really not doing much interesting work. I'm like counting the number of symbols in a code to try and follow it. So other libraries have kind of. Uh, also felt that maybe there's better ways of doing this. So that Bluebird has this dot props and it looks similar to this where instead of passing an iterable, you can pass an object and it will await each of the properties or well, for each kind of property, and it will get the value and await that and then give you back an object of the same shape. So this way, even if you mix up the order of these and mix up the order of those, you know, the, it's done by name, not. So I still can't collect control click jump, but at least I can just read the name and read the name. I don't have to count things or worry about things getting mixed up. So that's the kind of problem and like the rough solution on how that problem could be improved. It doesn't have to look exactly like this. You know, maybe it's from entries and object or entries as one of the things that's difficult with this is unlike an iterable that has a very clear um, API like behavior like semantics of how do you get all the things it's an iterable you have to wait for it with objects it's much less obvious how you get all the things uh, like the bluebird promise.props, you know, there being 
a little bit hand wavy on what that means, whereas maybe we need to be very explicit about what it means so people don't get confused about are we walking the prototype? Are we getting all the innumerable things? Things like that. I mean, there is fairly good precedent in the language of um, kind of what we do walk, like if you spread an object or if you do object or entries. Um, yeah, may maybe something like using the existing entries kind of pattern would be a better way to go, even though it's more verbose. So that there's, I think there's definitely things to explore um even though this maybe is yeah there the, nice the, the short. yeah when you say yeah when you say that there's uh precedent in the language the problem is that that there's uh several dimensions on which properties differ is, is, mm. and there's precedent for a whole bunch of different choices so there's there's you know um uh the narrowest precedent is um, things like object.keys, which is um, uh, only own, not inherited, uh, only enumerable, not non-enumerable, and only string named, not symbol named. Um, and so, uh, so I could imagine that you want to, you know, that another naming that you might want here is uh, promise.allkeys, Referring to the keys from object that keys, uh, not necessarily saying that's what you should do, but just the the you know there's, um, I think the triple dot is also just in is certainly just in own and uh, and just enumerable, but includes symbol name properties as well as string name properties. I think that's right, isn't yeah. Sorry. The uh, promise from entries is a little bit more explicit for that because you rely then on uh, on object and entries to give you that. The question then becomes: Should from entries also uh, await on the key? Right? The key is a promise, or should you only build out your string? Um, that's less clear. Yeah, it certainly op opens up that dimension that now we're not. We're definitely not limited to just strings and symbols necessarily. And presume it like this, I imagine this is going to not, maybe this isn't going to be a performance bottleneck in the code because we're awaiting and we're, you know, we're doing IO anyway, but I imagine this isn't going to be as friendly to optimize for compared to, you know, with the, the double indirection as opposed to just immediately the kind of the one layer. Do not assume that you're doing IO, right? I mean, this could just, it could, it could and often is still just local asynchrony that you're trying to co oh, coordinate. Yeah. I'm but, just, well, yeah, I agree. But, but nevertheless, I'm, I, I, I'm also don't find the, the performance difference something to worry. I don't, I don't think it's something to worry about. So the, the, the from entries and, and, um, and entries uh, that was so that would be uh, all own whether enumerable or not and whether string named or symbol name. So the another thing is that there's also this other proposal, you know, the await ops. I think this it's we've got to use the word orthogonal because it's TC thirty nine. Um, I, I think. Oh. That, that proposal it right. probably relates to this. You know, if that goes ahead, maybe yeah. we'd do this. But I don't think that proposal replaces this or vice versa. I think you know they are separate in in the problems they're trying to solve. So it's it's related, but I don't think they're actually I don't think they influence each other uh, in too much regard. So the the other question I think that would come up with this is what about all the other promisey things? Um, I think the the use cases, I and mean, I don't have concrete use cases for the other ones. So I only really have that use case of the promise.all problem. So I think this would be another thing of, you know, is it more complete to have the fuller API rather than special casing all? Or does adding all these extra things actually add more burden? So I think that's another thing I'd 
if this proposal went forward, I'd want to kind of explore, though my gut feeling is it's harder to justify uh, going all in with uh, creating lots of these multiple variants. Alex, I can see your hand. Only because I believe this is the last slide and I wanted to save my comments for the end. You're mute, Alex. Alex, you're muted. Okay, so uh, I have a couple of concerns and keep in mind, I'm the guy who originally pitched this two years ago to this group. Um, the reason that uh, Jordan and I abandoned this two years ago was the lack of a clear use case for it. Um, when we originally pitched it, we saw that we could, we could achieve roughly the same results with two lines of JavaScript code using existing APIs. And two lines is not significantly better than one. Um, and I don't think you've sufficiently answered that concern here with this uh, new use case. Don't get me wrong, it's interesting, but I don't think you're quite there yet. Um, thank you for pulling this up. So I'm looking at it from that perspective. Is it significant enough of an improvement to add to the language? And I'm on the fence about that. I'm not against it, I'm not for it. I'm just on the fence and that leans towards if, there's, if it's not a compelling enough case, do we need to bring it in? Especially since this kind of thing can be very easily implemented by libraries. That is my first concern. Um, the second concern is about possibly, um, because we, we could be talking up to four different, um, four different methods that we'd be adding for object analogs to the arrays versions of these, is maybe we want to put it in a namespace under promise. Um, I suggested say promise.dictionary.all or promise.dictionary.all settled, et cetera. But that's a separate issue. Don't bring it up on the screen. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'm really worried about the use case. Is it a strong enough use case? Yeah, so yeah, with the, the fact that you can achieve the same end result, in a two-liner, I think is um, you know, that the problem I'm stating is that the problem is on this line as opposed to being able to achieve this. So like the problem of these things here needing to be in the same order as these things here, which is trivial here, but becomes less trivial when these things become more complex and when the number of this increases. So, so specific, specifically, let me just make sure I'm understanding. Specifically, it's when those become more complex as inline expressions. If you just define, you know, if if you just take your complex expressions and you just have separate, you know, const shape p equals const color p equals etc. Uh, then by the time you get to that line, all you've got are variable names. Now you've doubled the number of variables. You have shape and shape p. Um, uh, and if if the total number is long, then you still have a, then even with just names, you have a counting problem. Uh, but I but I think that that um, you know that is would still be the the preferred solution to compare against rather than inline expression. So one so one thing I, I remember discussing is this could be a helper. And libraries have done this. So obviously, this is a helper that a lot of uh, libraries and people have written. I share every written mine, um, which does give credence that this is maybe something we should consider adding to the language. However, I remember discussions on what shape it should have. And it wasn't clear like that um, being able to create objects also was the only uh, like I remember a discussion about maps, but I don't know. Maybe it was an adjacent proposal, and and, and uh, not this one. Um, I don't know. I, I know also there is variations of this, which is more of a deeply fulfilled. So if you have uh, more of a tree 
uh, like nested promises, uh, like being able to resolve those. Um, we're like each, there's probably more use cases around um, around here that like we need to think if we want to solve them or not, or just stick with the very simple, uh, just the properties uh, of a record. That's it. One thing that I was thinking of the other day is another way you could, in kind of what you're saying about how this could be more, the, the entries way of this is more general, right? Because then you could use it with constructing maps as well. Um, so the curls promise to always and var args, it is singular. You have to actually pass the first thing. It means we do also have another extension point of the second argument. Like here, we could say, depth like two, which actually means I expect this to be an array of arrays similar to how you have like array flats kind of depth here. Where so if this was actually here, yeah, my like key value, you'd get almost like a promise from entries in a in a different way. It's, I think this then starts to become more complex and like, I see people less, fewer people likely to say, oh, my promise to door has too many things. I'm gonna rewrite it to use named version. But it's, it's another potential way of going from more complex thing, but now it's more general, doesn't add new actual APIs. Uh, and I sent like a, uh, a all entries, promise of all entries that I suggested last time we discussed this, uh, which basically lets you, it, it's not as ergonomic, but it can be. And, and I remember like when writing this, it was like not obvious what the right shape was. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe it gives like, Items that like there should be a built-in helper. As I said, I'm on the fence about this. Um, the reason I I lean against it is just. It's easy to implement a, it, it's very easy to implement a shim for this. Um, that's that's my big concern is, is it something strong enough where the engine has to do it for us? My, 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 my feeling on that is that it's easy to implement a shim for people that are very comfortable with javascript and promises which admittedly a lot of javascript developers are but compared to some other shimmable apis i feel like this is one that i wouldn't just immediately knock out i'd probably have to stop pause and think so i would certainly imagine it's more the type of thing you'd want to import from a library rather than quickly write up yourself especially as i do find maybe the first coming to JavaScript, that they're okay with async weight and promises, but it's definitely one of those concepts that takes a little bit longer to really feel re really, really comfortable with working with them. Like there's a, I remember like people, there was this trick of getting, oh, there was, I can't remember right now. There was always this trick of like combining promise.race and promise.all and flipping the resolve to get, yeah, there's, there was things like that, that it was clever, but it was, never always immediately obvious what it was doing unless you felt super super comfortable with the promise helpers and the way promises work flipping the resolve i'm trying to remember what it was i think it was maybe before we had um it was something where you do promise.race but then you switch or for every promise 
you change the rejected to a settled and all the settled to a rejected to kind of get the reverse. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was like. But, yeah. Sorry, I just dance out of time. Uh, probably so, turn. Okay. I, I share Alex's skepticism, but from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I think it's, um, I think we should include things directly in the language when they have ergonomic value. Uh, and this is just a normal thing to do in any kind of standard library. Not everything has to like give a new huge capability. Some things are just a little bit nicer or more convenient. Uh, anyone can implement iterator.range, but I'm a big fan of that proposal. Uh, but what convinces me more is like the code sample that, that Mark had where uh, you just define the promises above the promise.all as variables, and then you do the, the promise.all kind of simply just with the variable names. And it's very easy to verify that they're in order. I think we have a serious uh, developer understanding problem where people don't really get that you can launch the promises like this and they'll happen in parallel. Uh, and maybe think of promise.all as more like a fixed thing where you have to put the promise creation right in there. And I'm not sure how to address that that issue, uh, but that's the only real downside I could, I could think of. And uh, in this discussion and in, in Ashley's presentation, we've already covered why there's there's not kind of an obvious single design here. Uh, so yeah, that's that's why I'm not extremely opposed, but I'm kind of leaning in the direction of uh, not including this this right now. You know, if we if we want to think about how to improve the ergonomics of using promises and all all over the place, uh, there's also been that await dot all proposal. Um, I don't know. I think we might want to do like a broader study about where people get confused. I'm not really I'm really not convinced that this is like the main the main thing with promise ergonomics at this point. Um, maybe, maybe it is, and I'm missing something, but yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, for, with regard to the criteria for stage one, I would, I would certainly um, agree to let this go to stage one, but I'm, I'm similarly skeptical. Uh, this falls, I, I, um, I hope you've read my, um, my essay, The Tragedy of the Commonless, uh, How Large Languages Explode. Uh, this to me is very much in the category of what I, you know, of the, the improvement, which is, wouldn't it be nice if we could write it this way instead? And a lot of, you know, and sometimes those are worth it. Um, I'm actually uh, supporting the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the pipelining. Um, uh, a thing because it's it's such a nice improvement in the how you write it, uh, but you know supporting that one because it's very very high leverage. It has broad reach. It's one mechanism that once you learn it, you find yourself using it for a lot of different things. Um, uh, this one is well, it's not more syntax, so that's good. It's it's just more API surface, which is much less costly, but it's still just. Wouldn't it be nice if we could write it this way instead of that way, where there's not that much improvement, uh, and the way you have to write it now is not that painful compared to com you know compared to what you're offering, um, and you know other things like you know the the prior the things that that really change what you can do with the language um, with reasonable you know. What, what can be achieved with reasonable effort are to me much, just much higher priority than something like this. And the, the incremental learning burden of, um, of adding new methods to the API surface uh, that are then become part of every manual, part of it, what you need to learn, you need to not just remember the benefit 
when you're using it, of using it, you have to also remember the cost uh, when you're learning the API as a whole of, well, what's this for, what's that for, and just more things to think about. And it's those, those incremental learning costs of expanding the API surface, mm -hmm. they're the things that are just very easy not to take into account. Uh, I wanna register my disagreement with that analysis. I think uh, we should be making ergonomic improvements. It's just a question of, with, there is cost, but I uh, don't want to, I, I disagree that we should focus. I mean, I think you, you gave the example that pipeline is, is important and good, even though it's an ergonomic improvement. I think we'll probably find other examples in the JavaScript standard library that might not have extremely broad reach, but might still be ergonomic improvements that are worth it. I think we just need to analyze these things case, case by case. And uh, the the more decisive thing is about like how much of an improvement is it? Do we have these alternatives that that make sense? And in this case, we we maybe do. So I th I th so I agree with with all of that, uh, but I, th I think the thing that 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 I need to that I feel like I always need to remind people is that it's the overall learning cost of still just having more stuff that we also need to take into account in this trade-off. And that's the thing that is, that is you know, I, I think we, we suffer the most from, it, from uh, systematically ignoring. I don't think we systematically ignore this in TC39. I think we constantly talk about it and that's good because the cost does exist. Uh, but I think sometimes this is, uh, overemphasized. I think um, I, I I agree that I think uh, if this did go through to stage one, a, a very large emphasis of this would be working out how to research and measure if this is actually going to help, and how trying to also measure the cost of learning this in the first place. You know, add that. That up. I, th I think like the technical semantics and the naming, you know, is like that's there. But I think yeah, the largest part is actually trying to work out how much of a problem this is and how well this solves that, and then compare that to their costs, cognitive costs, rather than yeah, the technical complexity costs. But that, yeah, and time I, box. And I, time box wise, I'm aware I've used an awful lot of this this session now. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we we should go on to the next agenda item. But thank, thanks uh, unless, Mark, unless you wanted to respond to my comment, Mark, or something. I don't want to cut you off from that. No, just, just I, I think everything that we just mentioned is a great thing to investigate in stage one. So I certainly do support this for a stage one investigation. All right. Yeah. So on to the next topic. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Guy, you have the floor. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to pick up a discussion um, on on the modules virtualization, and I brought it up yesterday in the in the regular mo modules discussions. And Carity had some some good feedback on it uh, already. Um, so uh, it'll be I'll try and do my best to kind of recap where we got to yesterday on that as well. Um, but the the motivating use case for this is. Um, well, the, the, the initial reason uh, was uh, Dan, Dan prodding me to um, uh, think about, you know, what, what was left on my wish list here. And um, uh, in, in the last Canary meeting, uh, Shu had some reservations about the import hook um, and and the, the, the fact that it, during, the, that they've gone through a lot of effort in, in uh, V8 to ensure that you have a synchronous optimized resolver and they don't want to be running JS in the resolver. And this is something that they've been quite um, careful about to the point where um, we're even now in a situation where there is divergence between Node.js and browsers, at least temporarily, because import.meta.resolve is sync in the browser and async in Node.js. And, and that's been a a thorn for Node.js for a little while and, and still is um, in trying to rectify that. Um, but 
this this sort of strong stance on on that that resolver and bringing up that argument and then um, putting some thought to that and then also relating it to other stuff and um, uh, when when I first presented um, some of the ideas around modules um, for import reflection uh, it was based on a kind of a more of a static linkage model and then the import hook discussions were kind of around dynamic import I think originally um, as a sort of the general hook um, and I, I was wondering if there's if there's not still um, scope to actually consider both of these things coexisting and so the idea was if you have a um, on on the module instance itself uh, introduce a new instance method uh, I'll just share a very rough um, outline here um, introduce a new uh, link function on the module instance, which takes two arguments. The first argument is the string specifier to statically link. And the second argument is the module instance to statically link that specifier again. Uh, since we have access to module instances before they've been evaluated, this opens up a um, the ability to, to link these things before they've been evaluated. So that's a linkage that is perfectly compatible with cycles. And when you then pass that module object to your dynamic import, it it can already know that static linkage. And if it already knows that static linkage, there's no need to uh, call the import hook and go back into JS. And so that it, you know that that might mitigate V8's concern there. Um, at the same time, the import hook would still exist, so that if you didn't call link the import hook would be used to fulfill all the everything asynchronously. And if there is no import hook, it would obviously default to the, the default resolver. And what that gets us is uh, potentially a mitigation for V8's concern. Also, not solving virtualization, but giving us an easy first win on virtualization, or at least an easy way to handle some simple interceptions. Um, and uh, you can also imagine this potentially even extending to workers. So it, it might also be another way to to skin the workers problem in that import hook relates to the kind of dynamic host resolution where, where you're going you know, out to this pairing context, whereas the static linkage is something that could potentially even you know, exist in worker transfer if, you, if, you, if there was some mechanism implemented by which um, yeah you know, modules could be uniquely identified regardless of their um, uh, realm or host uh, environment context. So um, with something like that, you, you could imagine that you could, you know, link something, pass it to a worker, and you would get sort of their equivalent um, versions on, on the other side somehow. There's some more thought needs to put to that be put to that, but I was just wondering if that's maybe a way to think about that as well. And then it's only the import hook that gets stripped during transfer. Um, and then there, there are a bunch of questions that are still open, like should you be able to link things that haven't that that only are dynamically imported and aren't actually static module imports? Um, and then also um, if you want to have some shorthand like um like an object shorthand or um even a shorthand for linking against like uh namespaces and things like that but just yeah putting some thought uh to this as something that um i just wanted to get feedback from uh the folks here and um uh i i will let carity pick up with with his um his feedback on it i guess yeah, so I, I I see no problem with the API. It's just a lot more difficult because it's not only about link. You now have to do reflection. You have to give them what are the things that they're importing, what are the things that they're exporting, and um, those are complicated. They have different APIs, depending on what kind of import statement that you have, and yada, yada. Then there is a the problem of what happens if I do import a dynamic module that I already link statically by calling link. Is it going to be skipping the call to the dynamic uh, import hook and so on? So a lot of uh, little details there. Technically, yeah, it will work. 
but my main focus is not really about the API. My main focus is to try to understand really what the problem is with respect to uh, implementers and the specific performance issues that they have there and so on. Because the way, and this, we, we talked about that yesterday, but my point of view is that uh, that concern that they have about virtualization is not really, uh, it's, 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 it's not really going to be relevant for the case of layer zero. And the reason why I don't think it's relevant is because you are in using that. You, you, in order for you to do module dot link, that means that you're linking to certain things. You, 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 you have a module instance that you're linking to the dependencies of the module instance. So you're doing all that in user land, the same way that you will be doing all of that in, in the input hooks case. You're not in the browser uh, intertwined uh, resolution process between things that are created by the user using a new module creation process versus things that are created by the user agent that are also part of the same module tree. I don't see that happening because um, in the Arena proposal, we, we were very explicit about once you enter into the realm of module instances created in user land, you are in that land until you decide to go and delegate back to the uh, user agent a, a subtree of the module that you are trying to construct. And there is no possibility to have circ uh, circular dependencies there. Because for you to have a circular dependency, you must do it all in user land. And, and that restriction itself, what it tells me is that when the browser hits these modules that are creating user land, that concern that they have is no longer a concern because they are user land. All these things are happening in user land at that point. There's no, they will not slow down the things that are being loaded in um, in non-user land. So I, I, I'll push back on the actual concern here and try to understand better what the concern is. Because I don't think it's real for this particular case. Yeah, I, I don't know how to get further feedback on that. Um, uh, I forget which, uh, in which spec it was brought up in reference to at the last meeting. Um, I should probably check the notes. Um, but uh, so, I, from what yeah. I understand, from what I understand from you, the issue was mostly that they go, go and construct the module graph today, and then they have um, uh, part of the process is to go and do some some of the steps in a synchronous manner because they already have all the stuff in them. So you go and just ship through it and they do it in one go. And they don't want to go to use a line, but that will not change because from something that is being created by the user agent and linked by the user agent, you will never be able to depend on a thing that was created in user land. That is impossible. It's the other way around. Because you don't have a way to, to, to say, user agent, go and load all the stuff. And then on this particular dependency, I want to take over and I want to give you the intent for that. That doesn't work. Because this API doesn't give you that. It, this API gives you the ability to create a root module and then link to other things that are either created by a user land or created by the user agent. But it's never the other way around. It's not possible in the API that we are offering. So for the cases where you go into user land, you're a user land. So do the things in a synchronous manner or whatever, no problem. It will not affect or slow down what they already have. It's just a new process of- yeah. it's. I guess that's kind of, from that concern point of view, you're saying you're gonna have two code paths in your module loader, one for custom loaders, one for native loading. And when you're on the custom loader path, it's not such an issue. Um, and that's like an interesting 
question to consider with this virtualization because like are we are we virtualizing it to the point where you can uh you know where we're are we leaving native linking as like something that's that's special or different and then you've got this this new kind of um, virtualized linking which is as you say its own user land thing or are we you know completely unifying those paths that's a good question and it's be interesting to hear feedback on that both from you know if that separation makes sense or if they still would carry their argument through to the um the user land loading as well and say well we wouldn't even want that to to be jumping around um, yeah. i don't know I'll yeah. My 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 main concern. Uh, so one thing that maybe tactically we can do is trying, to, and we talk about that yesterday as well. Differentiation between virtualization and reflection. This is a reflection API. You're, you're able to create module instances. You're able to link those module instances. You're able to uh, require or import those module instances and get the values that they export or whatever. So it's not really about virtualization uh in in the sense that you're not really virtualizing um anything other than oh the import here i will be the one resolving it but beyond that there's no virtualization you don't control anything there it's just a resolution i would say but not virtualization so if we disconnect layer zero from the concept of virtualization then we should be fine because most of the concerns that google has is about virtualization as a use case um, so that's probably why they push back here. So tactically, we should probably disconnect that, those two concepts. Then this is not really virtualization. This is, I don't know what name we can put, but I, I would say module uh, instantiation resolution or, or just simply saying this is a reflection for module. This is a reflection API. We can do what the browsers are doing and we can do it in user land now. Now that we're virtualizing the module graph entirely, you're saying, I want to create an instance and I want to make sure that this instance link to other instances that I have a little bit of control on. So uh, I would say that this is important to clarify saying this is not about virtualization. Uh, this is about controlling subtrees of the module graph and being able to create any user land with the reflection API that we offer. Yeah, it, it would be great to be able to narrow down that feedback um, because, you know, if, if there are any concerns with progressing with import hook, it would be good to know um, and and have a have a path for it. And, and this is one. Um, the, the, the other things that this kind of does um, bring is um, potentially some um, like slight ergonomic improvements in the sense that like um, I guess it, it, there's also like this kind of like maybe slightly philosophical difference or question, which is like, are, 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 you know, are we coming at this kind of like whole load of angle where it's like you have to start from the root and you're implementing the whole graph and you have this the single hook and you need to know everything about everything and you need to be, um, you know, this this kind of power virtualizing user or do we want to like just, you know, come come at it from a direction which we can say hey if you want to resolve this to this you can just inject it here otherwise everything else is going to behave the same so and and there are you know a bunch of logical questions about that because like i think you mentioned the other one yesterday as well it's like are we then losing control of virtualization if now you have code that does this this kind of linking and you want to then virtualize that code you can't can no longer intercept it um the, the things that are you know, programmatically linked in this way. Um, and um, so, yeah, some interesting questions. Um, and then, as I say, the third thing was like, actually um, also possibly thinking about the, the worker linking again. And, and that's a wider conversation that, that um, you know, we probably need to still um, continue discussing separately and, um, you know, between all the specs um but yeah and th there was one other one other minor proposal here if you scroll down to the bottom um of this page and this was also in a similar vein um exposing import meta and and bringing up the discussion again about whether that should be um 
you know, re reflectable on, on the instance as a way to, um, uh, again, at a per module level, being able to uh, either inspect it or um, also being able to mutate it and um, provide instrumentation or, or whatever might be required. Um, and thinking of this in the context that for the module expressions and module declarations proposals, we will need an instance object, a module instance spec in some form. And for the import reflection proposal, we we are happy to align with these proposals and look at um, reflecting a module instance as well. And so if we are reflecting this module instance, thinking along the lines of should we try and make this module instance more incrementally powerful where you know small features can start to enable these virtualization use cases um, as we work up to getting the full uh, module source stuff together. So also like uh, thinking about like a kind of pro progressive virtualizations as well kind of angle and 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 also just to trigger some discussion. Yeah, so uh, my, my only feedback there is that virtualization, these API is not for virtualization. The virtualization will, is about the default behavior yes. of the the host and you replacing the default yeah. behavior of the host. Yeah. So it's not going to happen at this level. So you can have the same program that was written this way with the dot link or with the import hook or whatever is the thing that you mm. use. You should be able to get that program and run it in a virtual environment. Mm. It's not that you have right. to so the program. The, the, the import, yeah. The import meta object that is created is the one that's provided by the host or the host hook. And so in this model, it's just exposing it on the instance as the object, which it already is a, a normal JavaScript object. So, um, I, I yeah, I, no, I think I, that's I, a that good part, distinction. That part this I get it. I, that part, this this I isn't virtualization, problem. and there has to be a virtualization layer where you can properly have that top-down view of everything. I guess I'm trying to, because with all of these specs, we have to meet in the middle somewhere, um, just thinking of ways in which we can um, try and break things down or, or maybe um, see, see about how things can, can link together um, at various ways. Um, not intended. Yeah, um, for me, it's a, the important bit, the high order bit, is that we disconnect this API from virtualization. It's not about virtualization, okay. um, and um, if that's not clear, well, then we can we can chat about it. But my my opinion, that's the most important bit. Like this is not about virtualization; okay. it's about reflection of modules, and then virtualization. We can have those discussions once we get there, which is at the host level. Uh, container controlling the host level hooks. Yeah, yeah. I think Nicolo did the work of getting the meta to use the proper hook and so on. So eventually we are running in an environment that is virtualized. If, if we have the ability to virtualize those hooks, it will, it will work fine. It will, you will be able yeah. to still create modules linked in still getting the meta that's coming from the from the browser and so on yeah yeah so th this is more sort of ergonomics um trying to broaden the usability to javascript developers who want to just quickly create a, a you know a virtual module with with a custom mock or something like that and and have the ability to access some kind of um I don't know what we're going to call this if it, to, to distinguish it from virtualization, but perhaps just some reflection is overloaded, but reflection would be the right sort of term. Um, some some basic higher higher level yeah, module and, functionality. And on that note, and I know we're almost out of time, but on that note, this API is, is very similar to the original API from 10 years ago from Dave Herman, where mm -hmm. There was a reflection API where you need access to, once you parse the thing, you need access to all the uh, details of the parser. So you can then act uh, upon the intents and do some linkage and do some some of the things. Then uh, obviously 
there are other kinds of problems like, okay, well, what happened if I try to import a module, but the linkage is not complete, so it fails. Uh, so how the user knows that he needs to do certain things prior to mm -hmm. the the resolution. So it's there are a bunch of this this API is obviously a lot more complicated than what we have. Uh, mm -hmm. You need a lot more APIs. You need a lot more uh, care to do the right thing when it comes to linkage, and and then on top of that, you have to have your API anyway for the dynamic ones. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a uh, wasting a lot of time there. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of reflecting what you know Node.js or something does today, which is you have this global import dynamically hook, and then you've also got this sort of static linkage which gets applied on the actual object. So it, you know it, it's quite similar to what we are doing in 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 the you know in the engine. Um, and um, I, I guess there are some also questions there, like. Um, the way I would imagine it right now is that if you don't link anything, you would get the current behavior today, which is you, it just uses the import hook for everything. Uh, um, so what, one important note on this is that you 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 could implement this API in userland. The dot link you can do it in userland. There's no problem doing this because what it does is create an internal map that then the hook will use the internal map, but not the other way around. Right, so you 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 could you could implement this on top of the the basic import hook, right. um, assuming that we don't get a import dot sync function at some point in future, which this would be able to be compatible with. Uh, so <laughs> assuming we never get a synchronous import, um, which currently there is no um, no plans for, um, but just in yeah. terms of thinking about yes, differences yes. at a surface level. Okay. Yeah, that, that's it. Um, thanks for putting some thought to it. And um, yeah, I look forward to um, seeing how modules looks next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Beth, for the team. Thanks, Ashley, earlier. Sure. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Matt.